Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. Today's episode is going to be a little bit of a first. It's the first time we're going to have a former guest back on the show. Jonathan Maxwell is CEO and founder of SDCL, that's Sustainable Development Capital Limited, and he was my guest on episode 14 of Cleaning Up, and that was all the way back in October 2020. So Jonathan is one of the biggest investors in the world, and almost certainly the biggest investor in Europe, in energy efficiency. And if you want to know how he got there, then I strongly suggest that you watch episode 14 of Cleaning Up. And... For the sake of full disclosure, I'm an advisor to Jonathan and SDCL. So what we'll be doing today is getting a bit of an update on Jonathan's business, but mainly what we're going to be doing is talking about the world of investing in energy efficiency in the UK, in Europe, and in the world. And over the coming years, we're actually going to be inviting a few other former guests on Cleaning Up back to talk about their areas of expertise. These would be the people who are particularly engaging and knowledgeable. And so we'll be doing some deep dives and some reviews on a sectoral basis. So uh, if you want to make sure you don't miss those, make sure that you've subscribed now, either on your favorite podcast platform or else on YouTube. And so now let's bring Jonathan Maxwell into the conversation. Jonathan. Welcome. Thank Welcome you. back. Thank you very much. Great to be back. Thank you. And so, to be invited back. And you are the first person to have been invited uh, back on Cleaning Up. So uh, a good a pioneer as always. Now, let's do this. Um, there is a previous episode and people could watch that. But for those that don't want to do that, why don't you start by giving us a thumbnail sketch of your business? We don't need to go into the, as much detail as last sure. time. But what is it that SDCL and you do? So we focus on developing and investing in projects that infrastructure projects that deliver energy directly to the end user and that help the end user reduce the amount of energy that they need. Why fundamentally the problem that we're trying to solve is that most energy is wasted. Most energy is lost somewhere in the conversion, generation, transmission and distribution process. So by the time energy's got where it's needed, in the US, about 70% in Europe, 60 to 70% of energy can or will have been lost. Extraordinary um, inefficiency of supply. And that by investing in projects that deliver energy close to or right to the point of use, we can help to mitigate or eliminate a lot of those losses. So on-site or decentralized energy generation is a very big part of the investment platform that we manage. The other part of it is on the demand side. Now, Although so much energy is getting lost, getting to the customer, who is the customer? 70% of all energy in the world is used in buildings, industry, and transport. So while we're trying to find ways of getting energy where it's needed more efficiently, we're also looking at investments and making investments that reduce the amount of energy that gets used by the end customer. Typically 10, 20, maybe 30% of the energy that's being used by buildings, industry, and transport gets wasted. So improving that by putting in better infrastructure on, uh, again, lighting, heating, ventilation, air conditioning at the point of use and building on site generation like solar storage, um, uh, 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 ground and air source heat. However, we can deliver energy to the point of use. Those two features address, I think, the biggest problem in the energy sector that is largely been overlooked, which is that the, the energy system can be incredibly inefficient and that is, I think, for the reasons we'll probably come on to discuss, one of the biggest problems that we need to solve over the next decade, if we're going to have any hope in meeting our carbon emission reduction targets, delivering energy security, or getting the energy system to a price point that everybody can afford. Now, those statistics that you mentioned, so 70 percent, 60 to 70 percent lost en route on the production side and distribution, and then another 15, 20 percent, was it you said, that could be wasted at the demand side. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. It, um, how does it kind of fly under the radar? How is it that this isn't just the burning issue that everybody is working on, um, you know, not just a, a minority? <laughs> yeah. 
So, I mean, the, since the 1970s, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, now they became super famous recently again because they figured out how to make more energy um you know the the fusion rate yes uh, you know than than they put into it but actually what they've been doing since the 70s is counting the amount of energy that gets lost one of the things they've been doing is counting the energy that gets lost on the route from conversion this is their famous sankey diagrams isn't it exactly and we can put one into the show notes there for for those who've not seen one. I think it's a great idea. It's updated every year. In fact, the the UK Department for um, uh, for Business based Business Energy and Industrial Strategy actually produces one for the UK too, and it shows the uh, exactly where the trans- the conversion, generation, and transmission, distribution losses happen. Now, you know, this is complicated stuff on the one hand, but it, on the other hand, it's relatively simple. The energy system and the energy business has been set up to supply energy. That kind of sounds obvious, but each part of the value chain could be, probably is very efficient. You know, people are converting energy mm-hmm. from crude or natural gas into pipeline uh, as efficiently as they can. You know, there's big centralized energy plant like combined cycle gas turbines that are working as hard as they can to take a molecule and turn it into power. Um, you know, and so on. Transmission and distribution lines, leakages, or and so on uh, managed. The problem is when you put the whole picture together, right. the, the cumulative impact of those losses by the time you get to the point of use is not really the business of these you know, the supply businesses. And it's not really been the key focus of government. The key focus of government has been roughly 80% of policy, r- roughly 80% of the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, in the United States, is to do with supply side, add more energy into the system generate more relatively little money policy has gone into the demand side how do we make sure that it's not wasted in the process or dealt with at the point of use it's about customers that's com- that's fiddly <laughs> it requires a lot mm. of work thinking about not how to supply energy but how to solve specific problems to get energy where it's needed the 70 percent of energy that used mm. in buildings industry and transport and i think it's that work and it's a, it's a different business model dealing with the demand side than the supply side i think the good news is i think we're going through an inflection point and we're seeing this marketplace for solutions scale up very dramatically and i've been talking for more than a decade as you know about how much i hate talking about um primary energy because that seems to come from the 1970s you have the oil shock and then the developed world said we have to kind of get our arms around as much energy as possible. That's the most important thing is not to be left without supply. So we grab it, we call it primary energy and we measure how much of it we've got. And that's the key measure is what we've got. Whereas actually what we ought to be doing is flipping the whole paradigm on its head and saying, what are the things we want to do in our economy, transport, industry, buildings, heat, light, those sorts of things, and then figuring out how to do those as elegantly and as as um, as low impact as possible, but it completely flips the paradigm on its head, doesn't it? It's completely different. You're looking through the other end of the telescope, to put it simply. The um, I think that the, the, what you're really talking about, though, if it, when you boil it down, is a is a huge productivity problem with economies and with companies. If you think about this, it, it, if if we're losing most of one of the most valuable and essential resources before it gets to the end user. And then the end user then is going on to lose or waste more of the same stuff still. What an extraordinary cost financially in terms of carbon. And indeed, as we're fighting over limited resources a few years ago in the Middle East, now in Ukraine, this in it from an energy security perspective and resilience perspective, it doesn't make any sense. So the productivity point is how how do you fix that problem by fixing that problem if you can reduce some or most of the loss associated with getting it where it's needed and solve that waste problem at the point of use it's actually one of the biggest opportunities i think of our generation michael and frankly not only is it a big opportunity for productivity gains if we don't do it we're not going to achieve any of our economic financial or energy security goals and and it's it's funny because productivity is like a hot topic mm. and you know, both sides of the political spectrum will say productivity is very important, but it's very rarely phrased in terms of energy productivity. Yeah. It's usually around human productivity. Yeah. But of course, the constrained resource right now is humans and skills yeah. and talent, but it is also 
energy and natural resources. And so I agree. I think that there's a huge challenge, a need and an opportunity to frame productivity around all of the factor inputs of an economy. I think that's an absolutely essential piece, uh, particularly when you've got a situation um, like the uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, what that's done to markets. Now, when I started, I said, let's do a thumbnail sketch of yeah. your business. And we've dived in because we love doing this, talking about energy efficiency, productivity, yeah. the kind of content. Yeah. Just round out the picture of your business. Yeah. What do you do to solve that problem or to exploit that opportunity? Yeah, so there are fundamentally sort of three types of project that we invest in. Um, one develops and generates energy on site for end users. So if you're a data center, a hospital, a commercial industrial facility, you will have a 24, to a very, sort of round the clock, sometimes 24 seven all day, all year need for energy, both electrical and thermal energy. We will develop and invest in a solution to your energy needs. So we'll generate energy as close to or right at the point of use, and we'll provide, uh, we'll make the investment and in our investment um, return is associated with providing, providing an energy service, heat, light, or power to our end customer. CHP, uh, is that um, uh, combined heat and power? Is it solar on the roof? Just So um, a very large part of the portfolio is CHP. That's yeah. combined heat and power. So you're taking some form of molecule, um, typically, and then turning it into okay. a combination of power and heat. Most of, most of the loss that I described earlier is actually the feature of putting a molecule into a turbine. A molecule thermodynamically will create 50% of it will go to electricity. The yeah. other half typically goes it's, to heat. On the Sankey diagram, it's called rejected energy, I believe. Rejected yes. energy. And it's rejected yeah. because generally these centralized power plants are built very where, far away from the point of demand. So there's nothing yeah. you can do with the heat. So co generational CH, okay. okay. combining it about. What else you were going to run through? So we run that off natural gas if it's efficient, but more often off green gases, recycled gases, waste heat. Right. We do on site solar. Uh, we've done, we're doing geothermal. We're obviously moving uh, as heavily as we can into heat pumps and other low carbon or renewable energy technologies. The second thing that we do is help buildings, industry, transport reduce energy at the point of use. Big area is lighting, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, cooling is one of the biggest users of energy in the world. Um, and then the third area for us is, is distribution. Sometimes it's not possible to generate energy where you need it. So we invest in efficient distribution networks to get green energy where it's needed. Some of that's around transportation, electric vehicle charging. We have a big business around fast no. charging electric vehicle okay. infrastructure. Um, talk me through, you've got geographies and then vehicles. What funds have you got? So geographies first. So we're about 55% United States, 45% rest of the world. Most of the rest of the world is in Europe. Some of it's in the UK and a little bit in Asia. Um, in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, types of projects, I would say it's about 60% on-site generation and about 40% demand reduction or distribution. Um, in terms of scale of the business overall, um, our portfolio of projects is connected to about 55,000 buildings. Some of them are very, very big factories, industrial well, facilities, we talked hospitals, about yeah. uh, data centers, steel mills. Some of them are very, very small in commercial industrial facilities, uh, um, commercial buildings, some residential. Um, so it's quite, quite, quite broadly diversified in terms of how the investments are, uh, are structured or framed or housed. We have a London Stock Exchange listed investment company. It trades uh, under the ticker S E E I T. S E E I T. S E I T. Right. S E I T. Okay, and we're going to put a link into the show notes. For that. Uh, so we're, we're, we're not allowed to market it, but we can put a link in the show notes. Um, so that's got a pretty big portfolio now, about one point six billion pounds worth of investments um, across the world and investing in these types of projects. People say that it can't get this type of project to scale, can take a look at that portfolio that has really got to scale. We also have a private equity infrastructure platform. So we, and for the larger projects that take a bit longer, we invest in those with private capital. So, and see it, why do it as a quota vehicle? I mean, what's the what, what was the rationale there? I mean, this is presumably opening up the opportunity for people that are not allowed or just don't have access to the sector. One of the benefits of the investments themselves is that they generate income for a pretty a, a good good amount of time. The weighted average contract length of our projects, infrastructure projects, is about 14 years. So that can deliver a very sta relatively stable, predictable dividend 
policy through to our end investors. And I think that's that was the design. Now, how could we put a very large scale portfolio together that can generate income that we can pay out as a dividend and that can grow progressively? The other feature of our investments, because we're generating energy and we're providing energy services that reduce demand, is that we can add capacity to those projects. We can invest more, we can follow on. So it's a total return story, which I think is very attractive for institutional and for private investors. So yes, you're right, listing on the London Stock Exchange provides access both to institutional investors, we have some very large ones, as well as everybody um, through uh, right. the open market. And when you talked about investing and you can increase capacity, so you take over and manage these assets, you become their their energy provider, you take over the, the, the power source within a factory and then run provide energy to that factory. Yeah, so very, very often we're running the, the, the utilities or the energy system for our customers. So a couple of examples, we've got a very large uh, uh, district energy um, facility that we run in upstate New York. We've got 116 customers. Some of them are very big um, warehouse uh, uh, customers. Some of them are industrial. Um, we provide 16 different types of utility services, but the biggest ones are power and hmm. heating and cooling. Okay, so that's a. I think that's a good thumbnail, and hopefully people will have followed what you do. And when you came on the show in October 2020, you said, if we look at what we've achieved as a firm in the last two years, it's probably five times as much as we achieved in the 10 years before. We did grind through the 10 years <laughs> and the whole kind of origin story of you in China and, and the, the smog and so on. But in the last two years, as much as, um, uh, and this was presumably 2018 to 20, yeah as much as you did the 10 years before. Mm. What have the last two years since then been like? About the same again, you know, at least the doubling of the of the business. Um, I think uh, why, I mean, partly because, you know, we've built the scale and the momentum. Uh, we have a pretty broad reach. We've got a great network. You know, we're good at identifying where the projects are and getting them done. Um, I think partly because the total addressable market has grown. So I, I pointed out that, you know, most of the money, most of the policy over the last decade or two, Michael, has gone into the supply side of the business, right? Um, it, if you look at the energy investments, we celebrate how much yeah. of the of energy investment goes to Wind and solar and other... Yeah. No, but, he, but here's the issue. You know, it's all been adding supply into the system. Now, demand, sadly, demand for natural gas and coal and oil, which is still 82% of the energy system, has also been going up. So we've been adding clean energy, but there's also been an increase in conventional energy. Um, in fact, right now, post Russia-Ukraine crisis, sadly, there's more conventional energy being added to the system. We all read the, 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 the news around Germany and coal, for example. So adding new renewable energy capacity is happening at the same time as additions to the conventional. What we're interested in doing, and I think what's been starting to happen, is there's been a focus and an understanding that you have to reduce the amount of energy that's needed for output from a productivity perspective, but you also need to replace. So to the extent that renewable energy comes onto the system, it now needs to start to displace certainly coal and in due course, natural gas and other futures. And for that reason, we've seen the market starting to tra transform. And I think we, you know, in a high energy price environment, saving energy mm -hmm. is very compelling in an energy insecure marketplace uh, both policymakers and companies have started to worry about where they're getting the energy coming from. And for in an increasingly decarbonizing world, companies are really committed to decarbonization um, as well as, as countries. Then this becomes very compelling. But two years ago, um, we talked about how to achieve the Paris targets, you know, well below two degrees yeah. and as close to one and a half as possible. Energy efficiency investment, which was about sort of the three hundred billion dollars a year, according to the International mm. Energy Agency, our good friend Brian Motherwell, yeah. um, uh, three hundred billion per year. It needed to it needed to go up by about a factor of eight yeah. in the next ten years. Uh, was what we calculated mm -hmm. two years ago. So, um, you know, is it on track to do that? I don't think so. I don't think so, and I think it's even more stark how much uh, we need to change gears. Well, now, having said that, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, at least had 20%, broadly 20% of the budget goes into something to do with on-site generation well, or efficiency. I would say the narrative in Europe has also changed post-Russia. Yes. 
And yes. you know we're going to see that I think increasingly implemented in 23, 24. But the the the, the mood music, which is we're going to add more into the energy system, we're going to find replacements for Russian natural gas. That lot of that narrative, Michael, has been replaced by we're going to have to reduce 15% reduction in gas, 5% reduction in electricity, frankly, taking away all the barriers for distributed generation like rooftop solar in Europe, digitizing the European energy market has translated also into a mandate to to introduce solar across all commercial public buildings across Europe. So I think the storyline and the deployment of the decentralized energy and energy efficiency is going to is going to have to now because there's no other choice go through this inflection point fascinating though one of the recent episodes i think it was episode 111 the first episode of season eight was with dan Jurgen, yeah. the Amazing. you know the extraordinary uh energy analyst yeah. um uh, and um you know he talked about how he agreed that there was going to be a great clean energy acceleration yeah. which was my thesis yeah. um and in fact fatty birol the yeah. iea um has also postulated that but then he said Equally, it's going to be a realization of the importance of fossil and investment in fossil. He didn't split out and emphasize energy efficiency as anything particularly kind of compelling within the mix. I have to li- re- I have to sort of review uh, the interview because I think I listen to these things. I listen for these things. I think he said his thesis was about energy efficiency and it's something that he loved. But I do agree. No, he does say separately, he does say he loves energy efficiency. And I was sort of I was I was thinking, I was seeing whether he was channeling Amory Lovins there in some sort of you know, uh, subconscious way. But yes, he does mention it elsewhere, but not in that, you know, the big the big dichotomy is between clean energy supply, I think, and fossil supply, or the big the two big ones at that point in the interview that he pulled out. I think he points to a, 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 a realist, um, a realist di- di- uh, issue. It's not a dilemma; it's just an issue. The facts, right? The yeah. facts are that eighty percent plus of the world's energy is conventional, but it is increasing. So, going back to the point I made before, the only way we're going to get decarbonisation is to to deal with that and to make you know to use less conventional energy, make it more productive, and actually in due course replace. And it's such a big challenge. And I think this is the thing we're going to have to be really realistic about in 23, 24. We can hopefully green the electricity supply, but we've also got to be realistic about that too. Electricity supply, Michael, is what, 20% of the world's energy system? So, 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 Currently, yes. Currently. So, So the first job to do is to green the current electricity system. The next thing to do, which we all talk about, is electrifying more. Yeah. Now, you, you talk to Adair Turner, Adair Turner about yes. perhaps getting yeah. to a point where you're electrifying, yeah. what, 60%? Yeah, I think 60 and the rest over time. Over it's time. not going to be immediate. And I think this is the time. Yeah. This is yeah. the time frame. We've yeah. got to be really realistic about the incredible scale of the job in front of us over the next two to three decades. Mm. We've got to think in that period of time. We've got to think about what what change can realistically most ambitiously, putting it another way, be affected. And then what we do in the meantime, because we've yeah. only got eight years of carbon budget left if we're going to keep anywhere within the two degree threshold, let alone one and a half. And we do not have time not to improve the fossil use in, 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 in the economy. OK, but I talked to you two years ago and you're incredibly bullish Right. You, you say things like, you know, I feel there's a massive opportunity to take step changes now. Yeah. And um, it's a very upbeat and positive discussion. And then well, a couple of years later, Russia invades Ukraine. Yeah. And all these politicians start talking about new LNG terminals. Yeah. They talk about nuclear power, so small yeah. modular reactors. They talk about hydrogen. They're going to import hydrogen somehow. I don't know how they're going to get that mm-hmm. on a ship mm-hmm. because I, according to my uh, knowledge of physics, that's not going to work. Yeah. You can do it, but it's extremely expensive. And so they're all rushing around either on fossil fuels or, you know, they do talk about accelerating um, you know, more wind, more solar. Yeah. But doesn't that sort of fill you with almost dread that what they're not doing is saying that the single thing they can do most quickly in response to what's going on in the world, high energy prices and so on, is be more efficient, which we can do essentially immediately. So we didn't talk about this last time I was on the show because it hadn't happened yet. But the, after Russia invaded Ukraine this time round, it made me think about the last time they did it. Last time they did it in 2014, 
the European Energy Commissioner, Mr. Essinger, made a very, very interesting point. He said, for every unit of natural gas we don't use, is 2.6 units of natural gas we don't need to buy from Russia. Now, this set off a series of policy uh, frameworks in Europe, which ultimately ended up in an extraordinary policy called energy efficiency first, not second, third, tomorrow, maybe. Uh, so the, I think policymakers understand, by the way, the, the reason it's one unit you don't use now is 2.6 units you don't need to buy from Russia or anybody else is because of the efficiencies that we talked about before, just how much gets Correct. lost on the way yeah. to the point of use to unpack that. So I think it, there is a fundamental policy understanding, but what's happening? I think policy has massively lagged, has really let down this opportunity, frankly. And and yeah. I think that there is a, I'm, I, yeah, I'm optimistic. Uh, I, 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 do I think that energy efficiency should be 20% of the I, uh, Inflation Reduction Act? No, I think it should be 50% of the Inflation Reduction Act, but I'm happy that it's at least 20% of the story rather than zero. You know, do I think that energy efficiency first should actually be implemented? Well, when Ursula von der Leyen talked to us about doubling down on renewables last March and the response to Russia, Ukraine, the mood music changed to cut gas consumption by 15% by the autumn. So at least I think the, the headline policies, when the new chancellor in the UK, Jeremy Hunt came out with his energy plan um, uh, you know, in the autumn statement, at least he put energy efficiency alongside renewable energy and nuclear power as the critical backbone of his policy going forward, stated a national ambition. So I'm pleased to see policymakers starting to get it on the agenda. It was only Glasgow, COP26, when energy efficiency for the first time was put alongside renewable energy as an international ambition. We're getting started, but you're absolutely right. We don't have any more time to waste. We're wasting two thirds of the world's energy. We've got eight years to keep within any reasonable carbon budget. We can't substitute all of the fossil fuels with renewables within eight years. Mm. I don't know how much that's part of the policy debate. I don't know how much that's part of the corporate thinking. I don't know how much it's part of the investment committee discussion. But I don't think we should go into battles we can't win. I think we need to we need to make sure that we plan large scale, huge scale renewable energy transformation over the next 10, 20 years. And in the meantime, get much more productive. We can't solve, we can't solve the not being where we are. The world's in, as Fatih Burrell says, the world's first global energy crisis. We are, that's where we are, right? Well, but we can come out of it much better. That, that we can control. I think what's correct there is that we are, sort of, in a sense, finally getting serious. Yes. I, I'm, okay, I'm probing to see whether it. there's frustration because, you know, every model of the energy system since I've been doing this, so call it 20 years, yeah. but actually, to be honest, even further back, has said that 50% of what we need to do is energy efficiency. Yeah. We, there's no way, and we talked about it in the last conversation two years ago. And when we first met, and the very when we, first time. And when we first met. Yeah. So 50% of everything ought to be energy efficiency. And, you know, you go back to 2014, what the European, uh, in fact, you go back to the first, um, the, well, the Russian invasion of Crimea, and the European Parliament asked for a plan from the European Commission for getting off Russian gas. Mm. 2014, right. what happened to it? Nothing, nothing, nothing. In fact, the dependence on Russian gas increased. Mm -hmm. It didn't go down. So, you know, it's sort of, I'm probing for whether you're frustrated because what you're sort of saying is that energy efficiency is kind of now seen as a 15% solution, which is better than nothing, but it's nowhere near the 50% that it is and that it always should have been. I tell you why I'm not jump screaming about it, which is how I feel inside. I I actually do think it's rising up the policy agenda, and I want to be supportive of that. I don't think there's any gain to be made from being super critical. We are where we are. Now we know better. Let's do better. So I think that's the first point. I think the, the second point is I, I, I actually don't think there's an alternative. I think we've reached a point of no return. I think when European energy prices, by the way, for natural gas are five times what they are in the United States, when you know universities, hospitals, public sector, which by the way, use as much energy as private domestic dwellings, are paying four to six times the amount for the same energy that they did last year. I think when you're shutting down business and industry in Europe, as to your point with Dan Jürgen and Adair Turner, where there's an extens existential threat around in energy intense industry in Europe, 
there is no choice other than to rethink the way that you're dealing with the energy right. system. So I think we've actually reached a tipping point. I think 2022, I think Russia's invasion of Ukraine was a point of no return. Energy prices are too high. Hmm. Energy security, nobody cared about that at all in Europe. I wrote an article a year ago, January for the Atlantic Council about energy security first. Nobody cared about energy security at that point. Barely anybody cared in the United States about energy security, except the government who spent every day until 2019 securing energy security. But that we've now t- gone to the point of no return. Europe understands yeah. that price, security, and frankly, decarbonisation all depend on efficiency. But let me just challenge that. What are the two biggest stories of the last sort of year in energy outside the you know high prices it is basically hydrogen 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 yeah. hydrogen and fusion mm. right there's no appreciation in the press in the general business environment in the you know in the mainstream media that heat pumps are the solution mm. to all heating in fact not just domestic heating and commercial heating which by the way they're used very extensively already which people don't even know but even we had Silvia Madedu, this um, brilliant academic who wrote a groundbreaking paper that looked at industrial heat and found that 99% of European industrial heat could be supplied by using heat pumps, i.e. more than one times efficiency, more than 100% mm. efficient, um, 99% using technologies that either exist already yeah. or are under development. And the majority is the ones that exist already. I mean, heat pumps are the answer. And yet... Most of the press coverage about heat pumps is how, oh, you know, they don't really work and you couldn't do them here and you couldn't do them there and they won't work for this. And for high temperatures, you have to use hydrogen. And so I mean, doesn't that just burn you up inside? Well, maybe the problem with this energy efficiency story, certainly the one that I've heard before, Michael, is it's not sexy. Mm. Like Bill, somebody once said to me, I said years ago, 15 years ago, when I was looking at this for the first time, why don't people focus more on energy efficiency? And the answer that I got was a very misogynistic answer, but I'll repeat it. But it said real men build power plants. Mm. Right. So so there is a fascination with technology, with something Mm. which is new and shiny. What we're talking about is using established processes and technologies to improve productivity. Going back to government, most of the economic policy is about adding to GDP, adding to sales. Supply side works really well in that context it's much harder sell Mm. to say, actually, I'm going to reduce the amount of sale of this product into the system in order to gain on productivity on the other side. It's just a a harder sell into government. I think the point I'm making, which makes me more optimistic, is that I think that the underlying all of this, whether it's sexy or boring, it it was also nice to have, Mm. right? You operate a data center, you operate a warehouse, you know, it's a large part of your only bill, it might even be most, but it's manageable. It's a, it's a manageable cost. You don't have to worry too much about availability or energy security. And you know what? We're all on a decarbonization path and I'll buy a solar plant and offset it. That game was over in 2022. Energy is not affordable. And it's not going to be, I don't, I'm sure you and I agree with this. I don't think it's very likely to be affordable for the next four or five years, at least in Europe, maybe longer. So I think price is being very, very high. I think energy insecurity uh, and instability of the grid, regional differences, but transmission and distribution grids in the United States need substantial upgrade while Europe's suffering from availability from the war. And then decarbonization. Let's go back to that, right? Governments are committed to it. Companies are committed to it. If the grid is turning on more coal, let alone natural gas, to run itself, what are you going to do? And you know, the only answer is to start to get real, you know, look at the real electrons and real molecules and real performance of your buildings. But what forces it is money. And uh, you know, that that that's why I think we're in a different game. Now, talking of money, two years ago you came on and we talked about the EU, which was doing the Green Deal. This is going back to before the um the Russian invasion of Ukraine. There was the Green Deal, and they were talking about um you'd calculated the infrastructure piece of the green deal and then the energy efficiency uh particularly building efficiency piece of the infrastructure piece of the green deal and you came up with a figure of 350 billion euros a year um to be invested in the sector mm. uh, co-invested with you perhaps given to you to manage how has that played out has the 350 billion a year um actually started to flow i think it started but it's slow 
and it's you know and and if you know th this would be yes it would be a frustration you know that uh, under the um under the green deal the european green deal rough i think it was roughly 90 million euro billion, sorry 90 billion euros a year were meant to mobilize joined by 200 something plus billion a private sector capital like ours that would go into developing and investing in new projects it would be disp dispersed across the european member states look the the ball is rolling, but it's mm. it's taking time, and we don't have the time to waste. So this is where I'll get a little bit more belligerent. This is where the mm. at the same. More, I have to say, uh, the, the, during the last couple of years, Michael, we've seen a lot of different policy positions from the European Commission, haven't we? And there was one point where um, I think the plan was to build ninety six gigawatts of offshore wind to drive electrolyzers to make hydrogen to turn it back into electricity. That didn't last very long, but there have been some ideas that have been floating around in Europe, and have, and have yeah. to the point that you made, sort of taking attention. Yeah. I mean, the hydrogen seems to be one. It's not ninety six gigawatts, but they're still going. I think they're still trying for forty gigawatts or forty. I mean, you know, it's ten. Don't know how many. It, it's a, a huge amount. It's, it's over four hundred. Uh, billion euros that they want investing in hydrogen. Hydrogen seems to be this one that kind of you know never dies, but I suspect probably a lot of it won't happen. But the, um, I mean, the theme that's coming is is coming out here is that it's a really ex it's a vital area. It's an exciting area. It's absolutely non-negotiable to yeah. hit all of our targets, yeah. and it is growing incredibly fast, but not fast enough. Um, because the scale, yeah. we've got to completely change our attitude and our, the level of investment and level of policy. Going back to what I said before, if 80% of the energy systems are gas and coal, 80% of our answer to it from a policy perspective is to add new energy into the system, not to reduce it. So let's just think about that. That's, that's broadly speaking, if you look at all money that's been invested in the energy sector, it's about 80% in the supply side, about 20% in the demand side. Policy, same. 80% of policy has gone into mm. dealing with adding new energy into the energy system. Relatively little of it. The best, one of the best examples being the IRA in the United States being 20% yeah. into efficiency. So to it just to... needs to flip. We, right. we're, we're trying to deal with 80% of the problem with 20% of the answer. Yeah. So it's not nothing. It's just nowhere near enough. We need to not double. We need to triple or quadruple the level of investment policy focus and you know, effort that we put into this. I want to come on to the IRA because you, we've mentioned it a few times. I think the audience probably understands that's the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, which was passed. I mean, it was an extraordinary thing because the US seemed to have given up on ever having any climate, um, you know, uh, uh, climate bill passed mm -hmm. through Congress. And yet suddenly within a period of a few weeks, one appeared and shot through, perhaps because it's got this marvelous title of inflation reduction, mm -hmm. uh, whether it actually reduces inflation or not, I've got no idea. Um, but how is that? Uh, um, how does that work? How does it change how you look at a project? And does that mean that you now are going to go from your fifty-five percent US? Are you going to kind of put a bigger proportion in the US because it's easier to operate, or what does it do? There are a few. That are gonna, before we get into it, there is a misconception that the United States spends more money on green and efficiency than Europe. Europe spends more money still than, than the United States. I think there's been a complaint that this is absorbing capital and everything else away from Europe into the United States. Not sure that's entirely true. But to focus on the positives, yes, you know, there are tax incentives, there are simplicity simplifications that have been introduced into policy uh, and market incentives in the US, which make the US much more attractive than it was before for certain types of investment. Take solar take even the types of high efficiency co-generation projects that we're working on yes you know there is a market incentive it's attractive for us to make investments in those thanks to the inflation reduction act but that, again let's put it back into context you know this was a 550 billion dollar bill it was reduced to 369 billion it's going to take time to work its way through the system too so we had um a deep dive on it on episode 109 with yon yadigaroglu dependa saluja mm -hmm. from uh capricorn yeah. investment group um the podcast and the youtube channel supporters but the one of the points that they made very strongly was that it's actually uncapped it's not a $360 billion uh, bill. It's a bill that just says, if you do this, mm. then you get a check, mm. you get money. And so what, when you say, oh, well, only 20% of it is energy efficiency, isn't that up to you to prove that wrong? Just go and find and do more projects because it's uncapped. So why can't you just do more and then energy efficiency would be a bigger proportion of the 
uh, of the results. So we've been investing in the United States for many years, many, many years before the Inflation Reduction Act. And we're investing the same before as we have afterwards. We didn't go there because of that stimulus, nor do we actually invest in energy efficiency projects per se, because there's a market incentive or a subsidy. Like the benefit of generating energy on site or investing in projects that reduce energy is it's cheaper, Michael. Yeah. Like the, the, the product we deliver, the power, the heat, the light is cheaper than business as usual. So it doesn't, it's great to have a market incentive. It helps accelerate. But actually the underlying business model in the United States, in Europe, in the UK, now much more broadly across other markets in the UAE and broadly GCC, uh, Asia is highly compelling. It's cheaper. That's one of the key benefits. It's cleaner. By reducing the amount of energy that you use, you're literally taking energy out of the system. That that's a neg that's literally negative carbon. I think there's a fallacy that there's such a thing as zero carbon energy production. You can't do it. You can do it low carbon, not zero. Mm -hmm. But energy efficiency actually is negative carbon. You're taking energy out of the economy and you're improving the security of the system. You're improving the resilience of it. So for those reasons, that's why we invest. Now, the Inflation Reduction Act is an accelerator. It's hugely welcome, right? But it's not mm. the, the reason. I actually think that regulation should be the real you know, driver of change. You know, I don't think that um, public sector buildings should be allowed to leak energy. I don't think that the, uh, uh, the na national grids should be able to operate without a, a significant focus on efficiency. Uh, there's so much that regulation can do, frankly, to limit or mm. even over time eliminate energy waste. And frankly, here's I'm putting it another way. If you're, in, if you're investing in a public company, Michael, and you know the CEO is being paid too much, people go nuts to complain. If you're investing in the same company and they're using too much energy for the business they're doing, mm. nobody says a thing. You no. know, so, so I think these are some of the things that I mean, regulation is one thing. You know, and then making sure that investors and business understands well, that this is now one of the most important things that we can do from a productivity perspective. Again, and I, then punish, why Why aren't yeah. we doing it? And ask the questions. But this question about regulation yeah. versus sort of fiscal policy or central bank, this is something that I talked to Mark Carney about, yeah. and I talked also to Adair Turner, who yeah. formerly was the um, chair of the Financial Services yeah. Authority in the UK. You know, to what extent can the financial sector or incentives at the fiscal level, just a tax break, you know, can that really do the heavy lifting if we don't regulate transport and buildings and industry to actually make the changes and clean up their act? Well, Adair Turner said it's really government that's got to drive it. He said investors, I'm paraphrasing, but investors and even um, you know, sort of, um, if, if you like, sort of self-regulation can help to some mm. degree, but the government's got yeah. to do something. I, I agree on two levels, fundamentally. One is at national level. And uh, I'll go back to when I started investing in energy efficiency. One of the things that really grabbed me was the Chinese energy policy back in 2006, six seven. I mentioned this on our last show and you know, recognizing the enormous challenges they had. And this was the beginning of the medium term plan, which changed mm -hmm. China's whole economic future. They said, we're going to reduce the amount of energy that we use as a country by 4% a year, every year. It's an energy productivity per unit of GDP output, uh, by 4% a year, every year per unit of GDP output. It's a huge um, mm -hmm. sort of statement. And uh, that type of policy, which actually tries to drive change through the central, from central government, I think should be the sort of thing that we really think very hard about. So... You know, that happened. The second component of it, which I think is really in the public sector's gift, is that in most countries, they are responsible. This is the public sector and government buildings themselves for a very large proportion of the energy use. Just taking the UK, I think I pointed it to this point before, there's about as much energy used in the public sector as there is in private domestic dwellings. Almost everything we ever hear about is what I would call Paddington Bear policy on energy efficiency. We're in this home. It's, you know, if you want to save energy, Michael, put on, you know, a duffel coat and a woolly hat and a scarf. And that is basically energy efficiency, isn't it? Or insulate your home or get a heat pump. Meanwhile, the public sector, hospitals, universities, government buildings, the Ministry of Defence, the transport system are leaking energy every day. Barely any of them have on-site generation and barely any of them have LED lights, heating, ventilation, air consistent. So that is some, a leadership position public sector has to take because... Mm -hmm. 
if they get it right in their own estate, not only are they saving our money in public money, they can all, they're also in a position then that they can turn around to the commercial industrial sector. 60% of energy is public sector, commercial industrial, not, not private uh, households. Then they can turn around and mandate change. And that's really what needs to happen. In the UK, we now have the Energy Efficiency Task Force. Yes. Uh, have exactly. they reached out to you yet? Are you uh, are you waiting with bated breath to see what they do? I'm waiting with bated breath about all actions that would actually support right. it. But no, I think it's a great idea. I really do. I think it's a fantastic idea. I would I'd be delighted to have right. any level of support to it. Yeah. And I do think it comes back to this productivity point mm. that energy is a factor input into our economy. We cannot have a really health, truly healthy economy whilst whilst being profligate. There's been a mystery in yeah. the West, in fact, everywhere, about why productivity levels are so low. Well, I mean, we've talked all session about energy, right? Um, very broadly, that we waste maybe to lose, to waste is a hard word, but lose something like... Reject, reject, according to the Sankey diagram. Okay. It's reject, 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 to the world's energy. But you know, that, thinking about it in economic terms, from a productivity mm. perspective, this, this, this mystery, why, are we, why do we have productivity mm. limits? Isn't this part of the, the you, you, yeah. isn't this part of the solution? There's other factors to it, which I find fascinating. There's a huge nexus and interface between energy and food. Right? All food gets around because of energy. Food prices have been going up, been seeing it in Europe because transport costs have been increasing because of everything that's been happening geopolitically. So energy and food, but do you know how much food we waste? Forty percent. Right. And, yeah. and and there's another nexus as well, which is water. How much water we waste? Oh, I, I Before, define waste, but, and I'll make up a number for broad, you. Broadly the same. Let's call it yeah. a third. So, just for fun, if we're wasting sixty percent of yeah. our energy, forty yeah. percent of our food, and thirty percent of our water, this mystery about productivity limits starts to become a little bit more uh, you know, understandable. I want to touch on uh, uh, another couple of topics before we're done, and one of them is ESG because yeah. in the last two years since we spoke, there's also been enormous developments along ESG. And obviously at COP26 uh, in Glasgow, mm. there was the uh, Glasgow GFANS, the mm. Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. And then there's the pushback. Um, I would say the pushback in the US, yeah. uh, partly from Texas and other states saying, well, hang on a second, but ESG seems to be targeting fossil fuel use. And so we think it's a, a yeah. bad thing. But also a pushback really from, you know, I'm thinking of um, Stuart Kirk's uh, yeah. speech when he was the head of sustainability for uh, HSBC, pointing out that actually um, a lot of the hopes invested, I'm going to paraphrase here, the hopes invested in ESG as, you know, sort of the one box ticking exercise that will save the planet as being, frankly, completely absurd. Um, have you seen in your business ESG, uh, th those the, the change, whether it's a uh, renewed focus or a backing off from ESG, has it had any impact on energy efficiency investment? Um, I think uh, it should do. So the positive side of this is ESG is about getting, or at least I think should be about making sure that when capital's put to work, there's a positive side of ESG and negative, maybe before I get into that. ESG isn't actually about creating impact. It's about measuring impact. It's almost like an output rather than an input. And I think people get, I think that that perhaps is one of the issues with it, right? So ESG has been about trying to feature, you know, sort of understand the footprint or the, of, or the environment. But, but impact, when you're, when you're starting to make an investment and it's got designed to have a measurable environmental impact or performance positive one you know i think that that's having the having the more sophisticated metrics and more sophisticated reporting features associated with them i think is great and, and i think i think we want to see that but they i would love to see them more specifically focused on outputs uh sort of, you know, sort of effects rather than just simply on on reporting um you know i think from us uh i think social impact has been a improved i think governance is still lack, lagging behind a little bit but the, everything that you're talking about i recognize in terms of the backlash um you know i think green investments were on the run about two three years no, two years ago 18 months ago you saw huge inflows into the sector i do think that there has been some abuse by the fund management industry and uh, there have been some very broad definitions i think it's got very complicated um, 
I think if you look at some of the indices for, you know, green sustainability indices and you unpick them, and I sometimes look to invest in them myself, I find it very difficult because you don't really find companies to the point I made about inputs and outputs that are dedicated to the green economy. You find quite a lot of tobacco companies, <laughs> general industrial groups, fang stocks, so on. You know, More than gas companies. Yeah, you know, yeah. So, you know yeah. I'm not making the rights or wrongs, but, it, you know, th this is... This is because I think some of the metrics that have been applied by indices look at outputs and reporting rather than necessarily the specifics about the inputs and what these companies but you do. You said that um, that it's a, about metrics. It's about it's about um, data. Mm. It's about disclosures. It's about metrics. Oh, that but involves. It, yeah. But isn't it isn't part of the challenge that in fact. A lot of people have tried to sort of use it to drive choices. So they've been they want to go from, well, you're going to disclose what you do to now you're only allowed to do certain things or you're only allowed to describe yourself in certain ways and tap into certain cost pools of capital. And, and, and you're trying to change the cost of capital for the people not doing the right thing. So it's almost like the sort of the backseat driver with the longest arms kind of coming through and from the ESG is that is that a fair sort of description how you, you know the weakness that you see that that a lot of people have invested in it this hope that it will start to actually drive capital not just describe and disclose what people are doing i think that i think the hope is that it will drive capital it will drive choices it will drive um you know uh companies as well as investors to make choices you know which have a better environmental social governance output i think uh, my bigger picture frustration is I, I don't think we've got very much time, you know, and if and, and what are we trying to achieve? Mm. So I think all of those things are fantastic. But if you come back to the real challenges associated with carbon emission reduction, which is only a part of the E, e component of ESG, um, and you look at how to improve productivity and resilience, which are the key things that I'm concerned with, then, you know, you come back to some very simple uh, frameworks. 80% of human-made oh. greenhouse gas emissions are in the energy sector. So I'm interested from an ESG perspective in figuring out how we make that better and improve the performance. You know, and then frankly, 20% of human-made greenhouse gas emissions are in you know, forests and land management and agriculture. That's a huge area. So those are the two key areas that I focus oh. on. Um, I think that ESG as a subject is, is broader than that, has a series of different um uh, and and hugely it's got massively complicated michael how many mm. different esg standards are there i mean i've i've lost count but i can i know i've certainly got about 26 that we so, try, try and sort of ident analyze and report against yeah so i i at one point created a, a map of and i think it was more like 60 different global um climate ESG organizations working on different bits of the financial system. Those were just the global ones and it was massively complex. And some of the metrics are actually sort of epistemologically um, inappropriate. They just, you, it's not a question of, um, so a lot of the stuff around scope three, it's not that with more and more data, we'll get better and better and better at working out the scope three emissions of a portfolio because of the um, double counting, triple counting, and the speed with which you can turn over a portfolio mm. and all of the options and the, the 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 puts and the calls, you cannot tell what the impact of a portfolio is. Yeah. So it's kind of weird because we all know what a good portfolio would look like. But as soon as you try and measure it, it's a bit like um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You try yeah. and measure it and you just kind of disappear in a welter of data that actually doesn't provide any insight at all. I, yeah, and I, th I think so. going back to my points earlier, maybe to make them a bit more articulate, I think that's where you can address some of the massive challenges. I mean, the backlash that's happened in Republican states, in particular in the US, against Green or ESG has been about the fact that they the accusation is you're making these investments for ESG reasons, not for financial outcomes. And in fact, you, know, you could end up with an adverse financial outcome, and that is a breach of fiduciary well, duty. Now, you know, that's the challenge. And that's why, well, in a sense, if you go back into what I'm saying, if you can make focus your investments in areas that improve productivity, that make more money rather than less, that can so it's deliver a win, win, win. growth, then you yeah. can be very specific yeah. and very forensic. It's not possible to look at those investments and say you're doing something which is 
trading, you know, financial gain for environmental or social benefit. What you're doing actually is making an investment which by definition reduces harm and improves financial performance. One question, which is a technical question perhaps, is you can do all of that, reduce harm. Mm. So you've got, for instance, um, projects where you uh, recover energy from the exhaust of steel mills, yes. um, or you do CHP where you have to, you do it with natural gas, you said, um, which is much, much, much more efficient. Mm. So you're avoiding harm, but is it compatible with net zero? Now that the goal, more so than two years ago, is absolutely clear we need to get to zero, not just to, you know, better or less than would otherwise happen. How do you make sure you're compatible with net zero in all of the activities at STCL? Yeah, we, 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 we think about this a lot. And, you know, I think the first point is making sure that we're very clear that we're using best available technology because we really don't want to sacrifice the good on the altar of the perfect. You know, we really want to make sure that over the next 10 to 15 years, the lowest carbon, most efficient solution is being delivered to that customer. And Michael, if you can't deliver it with 100% renewable heat today, I would rather deliver it with the best available technology. I'd rather go with the, you know, the old Bismarck phrase, politics is the art of the next best. You know, we do have to make substantial step changes. Now, over time, you know, what we always look at year on year, day to day, is how to, if we are investing in a cogeneration system that uses natural gas, which might be operating at double the carbon efficiency of the grid, how can we substitute the fuel? How can we tie that up with the supply of green gas? How can we use greener gas systems in the future? You and I know that you can run an engine on hydrogen if you inject it by the by cylinder head, but we need to make sure that we're getting the hydrogen from a green place where supply isn't so easy today. So we do what, what we look for are how do we make step changes, the best step mm -hmm. changes that we possibly can in the next 5, 10, 15 years in buildings, industry and transport. But we're continuously looking okay. at that to invest in. So if there's a substitution technology, we're able right. to imp implement it. Do you have for each of your projects, each of the things you invest in, do you have at any point in time a plan for that to go net zero, not just net better, but net zero eventually and in time for 2050. Yeah, so we have a net zero target for our funds. We have a, um, we have, uh, the, the European Commission has categories which it's set up under the taxonomy, it's effectively categorizing investments uh, under op Article 8, do no significant, no significant harm. Article 9 is a much more proactive um, standard that we set ourselves, which is really to try and get to, um, you know, and ultimately to align ourselves to a net zero plan. So the short answer is yes, over time, you know, our plan is to make sure that our assets, our portfolio perform to a net zero standard. It is going to take time, you know, and you know, some of those solutions are going to have to be introduced when they're available. So we're almost out of time. What I want to know now is what are your predictions for the rest of 2023, this new year? And then perhaps any that you can highlight through to 2030. So um, I have some fun at the beginning of the year and, and risk being wrong. Um, I think uh, at, at right now, as we're sitting here today, um, gas prices in particular, which is the biggest driver of energy prices, are sitting at levels that we haven't seen since be before the Russia-Ukraine crisis. I don't think that's going to persist. I think you know we're going to we we Europe has run very very high levels of storage through the winter we're through a relatively mild winter and I think the combination of that storage being released and the fact that we no longer have access as Europe to Russian gas and therefore we're going to rely on diversified supply and on the United States means that there's upward pressure again coming back onto uh, European energy prices I'll be even more uh, uh, risky here and say that I fear that, that that higher energy price environment will catch into the United States. So I think there could be a more a broader contagion because we're going to have to buy natural gas uh, LNG, as you pointed out, to new terminals here in Europe from the US. And currently it's five times more expensive uh, gas in Europe than the United States. I'm not sure how long that persists. I think that the um, concept of a uh, re reducing inflationary environment Inflation may persist longer than 
something mm. that people would like to think. And I think that's well, partly linked to the fact that energy is a very big part You're of a it. bundle of fun. So you're, you're saying the, the energy prices are going to turn back and go up and the inflation is going to persist. I think these are challenges. And yeah. I think that you're seeing federal governments using, uh, sorry, uh, central banks rather, using uh, you know, interest rates as a as a, an instrument to mm. keep down inflation. What does this all mean? Okay, maybe be a bit more fun. I think this really is a huge opportunity for the energy sector to get its act together. You know, I, I think it's under that high price environment where energy security is a challenge and decarbonisation is a, cri- a critical objective for all of us. I'm actually that's one of the reasons I'm so optimistic. I think that we've now gone through a tipping point. I think we have to start really focusing our efforts on much more energy productive uh, uh, you know, projects, uh, a much more efficient energy system. Um, and I think that is going to be a big feature of European and energy. And but you're now doing that business. in a higher interest rate, an inflationary and higher interest rate environment than when we spoke two yeah. years ago. There's probably well, 300, 400, 500 basis points difference in the interest rates that your projects are uh, being um, charged. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're dealing in a much higher energy price environment, a higher rate environment. I think the good news is that the benefit, the cost benefit of implementing these projects mm-hmm. is even higher in a high energy price environment. So I said the net economic impact for uh, and benefit of delivering these projects is going to be very, very, very good, if not better, notwithstanding the increases in rates. So a difficult environment, but you're optimistic. And then where does it get us to in 2030? I mean, are, are we going to be bending the curve on emissions? You know, we, we talked about um, you have to get 50 percent down by 2030 to be on track for one and a half degrees. I personally think that that's not realistic. We're not. We, no, I've no. said goodbye to that in 2018. Uh, 25% down to be on track for two degrees. Are we going to get anywhere close to that? Not, Where without, are we going not to be? without a huge change in attitude towards efficiency. Like, as you say, it needs to double, triple, quadruple in terms of focus. I tell you, that here's a quick prediction. Don't think nuclear power is going to produce much in terms of low carbon energy by 2030. I don't think that however much we focus, which I really, really hope we do. That's additional. The nuclear additional. is not going to produce no. additional yes. because, of course, it is 20% or 30% or whatever, 20, 20, more than 20% of... Of, of electricity today which, which is 20 percent of the energy system but right. yes yeah, so in but it's certainly in relative terms it's not going to change the game i don't think other very large scale renewables are going to change the game either by 2030 although i would like to see massive scaling up mm. and i really really hope we do um, but i would be surprised if we got much further than the numbers that you suggested at the top end 50 60 percent of electricity but you still got the other 80 percent of the energy system which is running on mm. conventional energy system so 2030 is very very hard i actually think and and i don't think hydrogen is going to save the day either nor do i think it's all about all of this or all of that i don't think it's possible to say it's all solar it's all wind it's all hydrogen there's no silver bullet it's all of it we need all of them but i would predict that by 2030 this problem does not get solved on the supply side i can't see Mm. any feasible technical financial way it does i think if there's a focus on improving efficiency and reducing energy consumption on the demand side. I think there's a massive opportunity because we're wasting two thirds of it. And, and, and that's what makes me so optimistic. It's so extraordinarily inefficient, the way that we provide energy into the system and the way that end customers, 70% of the energy being used in buildings, industry and transport, 10 to 30% being wasted. That's such a big prize that it gives me great grounds for optimism that we can achieve the 2030 or something like it, but not by what everybody thinks in terms of a a gleaming new uh, solar panel on its own. This is going to have to be a systemic change. So we talked about that kind of 15% focus on energy efficiency when it needs to be 50% or possibly even 85% in the near term. So um, that's a very um, articulate, passionate um, pitch for energy efficiency and investment in energy efficiency. So thank you once again for joining us here on Cleaning Up. And I look forward to coming back and revisiting those forecasts uh, over the coming years. Thank you for having me back, Michael. Really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. So that was Jonathan Maxwell, CEO of SDCL, that's Sustainable Development Capital Limited, talking about energy efficiency, why it's so vital and how to invest in it. And Jonathan is actually writing a book called The Edge, which is going to be published in autumn by Hachette, 
And when it comes out, I'll make sure that I let listeners know all about it. My guest next week is James DeMuth. And James is the CEO of a company called Surat Technologies, which does additive manufacturing. So please join me at this time next week for a conversation with James DeMuth. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation.